Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Zoom In on a Fresh Conversation. It is Monday night all over again. And tonight, our special guest is Denise M. Caffo, president and CEO and co-founder of Society First. Welcome, Denise, to Zoom In on a Fresh Conversation. Thank you for being here this evening. If you did not know, thank you for being here. If you did not know, the state of Florida has more than 13,000 people serving life without parole, far more than any other state and almost a quarter of the total nationwide. Over 13,000 people. Let that kind of resonate because we are going to be talking about how that's crazy, first of all, and how society first is out, out in the forefront trying to make a difference for the people who are behind the walls. But Zoom In on a Fresh Conversation is sponsored by Eyeless Diamonds LLC, brought to you by Milton McCulloch, author of Love and Emancipation, L.D. Robinson, owner and operator of Adaro Press. And I invite you to attend the artist talk at the Deland Museum of Arts featuring artist Weldon Ryan on Thursday, April 25th at 5 p.m. If you need more information on that event, please email me at freshbookfestivals with an S at gmail.com. If you have any questions for Denise, please leave them in the chat box. And this conversation is being recorded. Good evening, Denise. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am the president and CEO and co-founder of Society First, which is a relatively new, young 501c3 nonprofit that's operating in the state of Florida uh, to basically bring mm -hmm. some meaningful criminal justice reform. And so uh, how long have you been around? So it was an idea. Um, it was a vision that God gave my uh, partner and co-founder who is incarcerated with a life sentence in Florida um, in October of 2018. And we threw that idea back and forth. And then finally, God released me to build a website. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and it literally took me about four months to build the website. And um, that that actually was the birth of it. Um, and we have been just laying the foundation since then. And then this January, um, we had our inaugural conference, which is an outstanding story within itself, how it went in that direction. But that was actually our coming out. And God definitely was moving and he opened so many doors, it was unreal. So tell us about that, tell us about the conference. So how this all came about was um, my, my partner um, and the visionary behind Society First um, had a lawsuit um, against the FDOC and going up against the FDOC, I called every attorney in the state of Florida and no one wanted to take no. it on. At any rate, he did it pro bono and it took us years and he won. Wow. He got me and we believe that it was God blessing us um, for us to hire two criminal attorneys to get him back in court. He's been um, in prison since he was 18 for a crime he committed um, and he will be 44, 45. I don't know. When you get my age, you lose track. Right. So he's been there over a century. Um, and just as I was getting ready to sign the financial agreement, God gave him a vision. And he said, no, this is not what we're supposed to be doing with this money. What we're supposed to be doing with this money is to bring attention to Florida and the mass incarceration that's based on the backs of the life sentences and the unconstitutionality of these life sentences. And we have to um, you know, build this uh, organization, create an organization, build it. And we need to have... Um, a conference and I was like a conference Are you doing okay <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah I, I mean needless to say I was I was devastated you know um I really was because mm -hmm. that's the hopes of getting him out of prison and to me it's gonna take you know criminal defense attorneys to get him back into court but you know 
we're a Christian organization. So when he said that that was a clear vision of God, then God's going to give us provision for that vision. And that's the direction that we went. And, you know, when he said conference, I've, I've been a part of other advocacy groups. I've been doing this about six and a half years, you know, and we've traveled around educating loved ones of the incarcerated in little church rooms and whatnot. That's what I was thinking. I had no idea this was going to be 200 people. We were going to fly people in from all over the nation. Wow. And, you know, celebrity national organizations came alongside of us and basically took us to a level that most organizations don't get to. In years. Four, five, six, yeah. Right. So I was just, I, I still, I, I mean, the, the fact that God, believes I'm worthy enough to be used as a vessel. I, I just, I walk it on every day. You can't, you can't uh, run from what's destined to happen. I guess. <laughs> I, you just can't, you just can't run from it. So when you were building your conference, and this is not one of your questions, but I want to know, so how is it that you became a tentacle? Because you had to reach out to a whole lot of people. How did that happen for you? Did you just pick up the phone or how did it happen? It, I don't, it, I really don't. It was, it, I don't even know. I, it just kind of happened. You know, God put certain people in our paths and everybody just started doing different mm -hmm. things. And it, it just all of a sudden, like I woke up one day and I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, just unbelievable. And I mean, to sit up front in the audience and see, I mean, it was so inspirational to me. It was like, I was just a person in the audience. It, it was like, I was seeing it from outside the bubble and literally I had tears and I just, I, I and it, it's amazing because almost every single person that was at that conference and that is a Christian, they openly said, you can see the Holy Ghost all over this. And I mean, it was just I'm, like, I, I cry all the time because it's just so, it's like, I feel like a cry baby, but it's just so profound. It really is. Yeah. When those kind of things happen, you just, yeah, it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to stay in the moment because you just can't yeah. believe what's going on. Right. Right. So, so tell our audience some of the recent changes in the prison system when it comes to residents and contacting the outside world. So um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know why they are continuously trying to strip these individuals of all of everything. Um, they recently took away mail. They will no longer hold a piece of mail. Okay. And, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, uh, someone who writes letters on a regular basis or something, but you have to really think about the elderly parent that sends a birthday card um, or the child that draws the father the picture, okay? And they won't be able to hold it. It's all being scanned and they'll receive it electronically. So unless they wanna pay, I think it's 25 cents a page, they're never gonna hold anything again. Um, and most people who are incarcerated don't have 25 cents a page. And, you know, when I first got started, I had no comprehension of the, the guys used to say to have your name called mail mm -hmm. call. You have no idea. I mean, it keeps them going to the point where I started birthday lists and I would send out stacks of birthday cards and Christmas cards and Hanukkah cards. And I would get messages. You're the only one that sent me a card. You're the only one that remembered me. I mean, it affected their lives profoundly. So to take that away and say, the reason being is that contraband drugs are being sprayed on the card and this and that, it's absurd. Hire a dog, let them sniff the mail. That's unbelievable. And, yeah. and it, do you know any other restrictions? I do know that the ladies that I know who have gone to uh, the place with, you know, walls, without walls, mm -hmm. with walls, gated community, right, um, have, have uh, said that they're just, 
mortified just to get in the door. Um, it's, uh, you know, I go in and out of the prison system and- um, Excuse me one second. Uh, someone's phone is buzzing. Could you cut it off or put it on silent? Thank you. So go ahead. So I, I go in and out of the prison system. And to me, you would think that the Florida Department of Corrections, regardless of what facility you go to, would be like McDonald's. It's a franchise. It's all the same. It's the same agency. How this facility does it, this facility should do it. It's it, That is far, far from the truth. You can go into one facility and they'll treat you as a civilian respectfully, politely. Um, they'll gently pat you down, whatever. And you can go into another facility where you are treated as if you are an incarcerated individual. And I mean, it's just short of being sexually harassed. I've had female guards stick their hands down my pants and mm -hmm. ask me if I'm wearing underwear. I mean, what's, what is the purpose of that? You know, and I, I can't blame, it's not the agency, it's the lack of training. It's, it's the people that, that work there. Um, you know, I, I believe that they're the only state agency that doesn't have to go through some form of psychological testing. And you would think of all places, this mm -hmm. place would require it. You know, um, there are some very good officers in the system. However, there's just so many bad ones that it, it makes it hard for the good ones. Mm. You know, they need more training. They, they don't need to be 18 years old. I mean, come on. What, Absolutely, what, have no life skill at all. No, an 18 year old in that type of environment is, and, and at this point in time, it's been announced multiple times that our state prison system is at a critical point. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it's on the verge of of something serious. Um, so it's critically staffed. There are about fifty five hundred uh, positions Open. empty, vacant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they're oh. closing dorms. Um, you know, it, it's it's like it's it's just it's it's not good. It's, it's, it's not good. It really isn't. Now, is there a difference? For our audience, for those who do not know, is there a difference between a state-run institution and a, a private facility? Um, a private facility or a federal facility? Um, GEO is not private. Yeah, G GEO is a is a, a private. Um, right. It's a company that runs a couple of private institutions. And yes, there is a big difference. Um, <sighs> And it's a double-edged sword. You know, you can have 50% of the people say that geo-run facilities are far better than state-run. And then you have the people that say, you know, the opposite. Um, some say they have better food. Some say it's a better environment. Some say some have air conditioning. You know, you can go back and forth. But the bottom line is... <sighs> The system as a whole, whether it's private or state run, is not a system of rehabilitation right. or redemption or right. healing or right. any of those things. Um, it's just about mass incarceration, locking them up, throwing away the key and, you know, judging mm -hmm. them based on one mistake that most of them made early on in life. And, and you know, it, it, it beguiles me that they use the mandate that the brain is not developed mm -hmm. to age 25 for some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so- um, But not for all people. Right, so th that, is, that was a big deal a couple of years ago where that case broke that, you know, the mind is not mature. And it, it even came out that it's unconstitutional to sentence a juvenile to life. However, there's hundreds of people that have gotten back into court on that basis, and they are once again resentenced to life. I, so what do they do? Wait till they're 20, they wait till they're 26. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't, you know, and 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 I mean, truthfully, there are some people that deserve to be in prison. Absolutely. You know? Um, but there needs to be a system 
that gives the opportunity for someone to do the work to redeem themselves. You know, an opportunity to better themselves, to to work towards, you know, whatever it is they need to find out whatever it is that caused them to you know do that crime commit that crime and educate themselves and you know learn tools and whatnot to when they are released to become productive members of society and i would say that that generally is not happening and it's not something that's offered to lifers because at all the mindset when it comes to lifers are you're not getting out Therefore, we cannot waste our taxpaying dollars on that. Um, personally, there's a lot of taxpaying dollars that is being wasted on this system as a whole, $2.8 billion. And it doesn't work. It, it's, not, it's not creating a safety environment for anyone involved. Um, you know, if we can fix this system and make it a system um, that gives the opportunity for rehabilitation and redemption and allows these people to be able to give back to society the you know one that they took from before the, these taxpaying dollars can go to so many other things education communities i mean just i mean i could go on forever with that so Denise, I read somewhere that half of the people that are incarcerated in the state of Florida are there for drug offenses. Is that a true statement or maybe not? Well, I, I don't know what the I don't know what the statistics are as far as the different categories, but I can tell you that there is a huge number of people sentenced to life that never harmed anyone. Right. Wrong place, wrong um, time. You know, um, it, we have the felony murder rule in the state. So basically, you know, if I came to you and said, you need to give me a ride to 7-Eleven, you think I'm going in to buy a pack of cigarettes and I go in and rob the place and kill the guy and jump in the car, you're getting the same charge I am. You didn't shoot him. You didn't even know, but you're getting the same charge. Um, and there's a lot of people that have life for marijuana charges. Right. Um, yeah. And, That's what I was getting at. And, yeah. And nothing so far historically has been applied retroactively. So, I mean, marijuana could be completely legal today. And all those people that are serving life will serve life. Regardless. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I think... And I think in 18 states, it's legal, completely legal. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's sooner or later, it'll probably be pretty much legal anywhere. Um, it's big money. It's just like the prison system. It's big money. I was I was reading up on uh, some of the statistics and, and, and wanted to get more information, up, not only for the audience, but for my own brain. I was thinking about all the people that they incarcerated during prohibition and like, out yeah when when alcohol became you know a money-making institutional thing right and so somehow all of them just got let out but anyway that's that's a whole nother story that's a whole nother program so let's right. talk about the society first and um what is it doing or what is the um benchmark to change the just to change the criminal justice system. What is your mission? So I know our right? main goal, the mission is this long. <laughs> yeah. So our main goal is to bring a restorative criminal justice system to Florida, one that heals rather than destroys. Um, the system up to this point has been a very destructive system that has kept neither those inside or those outside. Um, safe. Um, it's our focus to revolutionize a systematic change that restores lives. And in order to do this, we must force the legislator that year in and year out refuses to reform a recognized and admitted broken system. Right. Um, 
we see only one way to do this, and that is to force the legislator to do what they don't want to do. And this starts with identifying the pulse behind the present system. Um, and that, that pulse is the life sentences that mass incarceration is built off in this state. Um, all you have to do is simply map the lines of the ugly Confederate history that is interlaced into Florida's politics and infrastructure, and you will see not only how the will of the people has been ignored and circumvented ever since 1885, mm -hmm. but why. Um, under Article 1, Section 17 of the Florida Constitution, the life sentence has been forbidden for 135 years now. Under the prohibition of excessive punishment, it has been constitutionally illegal to give a life sentence as Florida's constitution distinctively states, indefinite imprisonment is forbidden. Mm. And through and 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 though we understand that there are those who need to stay locked up and away from society. This does not mean that those who exhibit redemptive qualities, regardless of their offense, do not deserve an opportunity to become a productive member of society again after doing an adequate amount of time. Like in California, if you're sentenced to life, you get out in 25 years. Well, to some people, that's a lifetime. To some people, it is. Right. I mean, this, this state, we sentence men, women, and children as young as nine years old to life. I am dealing personally with an individual who came to me that I work with, who a 14 year old is looking at life. 14 years old to, to lock this kid up. First off, what, what is gonna have to be involved to lock him up is, they immediately direct filed him, which means they immediately decided this 14 year old is going to be tried as an adult. So when he gets convicted of whatever he gets convicted, they are going for life. He will be sent to an adult prison. The only way to protect this little kid from predators is to lock him up in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement has already been proven that you could put the most docile individual in there. And when they come out, they are so messed up and deprived that they have the capability of committing murder. I don't understand how one, that is deserving of taxpayers' dollars, and two, who is that benefiting? It's not bringing the victim's loved one back. This family over here has has lost their child, but it's it's not it's doing nothing. No, nobody gets any benefit out of it. You know, we we our taxpayers should be going to one get that kid. Obviously, you need some kind of mental health help, okay? Um, and and then he needs to be poured into. He needs help. He doesn't need to go to an adult prison. So what is the line that's drawn before you go to juvenile? And is it, does it have to do with, with killing someone or what is, it, what is the line? Someone has uh, to die. I'm not, I'm not really sure what the law is, but I can tell you that Florida tries more juveniles as adults than uh, most other states. I watched a documentary where there's some um, prosecutor, I think in the Jacksonville area, and she is the one that deemed the term super predator, that they're super predators, that they either need to be destroyed or put away forever. I, I mean, and, and I, I can tell you, I spent a week behind the walls um, a couple of years ago at a gang summit where I mean, I wasn't in a visitation room. I was behind the walls, walking freely amongst the men, okay? And everyone was getting up and giving their testimony um, of how they have rehabilitated themselves and what they have done in their time of incarceration. And I can tell you that 96, 97, 98% of those men, the trauma 
that they went through. I mean, just horrific, horrific things early on in life that, I mean, and, and, and to that catapulted that, them to the situation they're in right now. Yes. I mean, yes, it's all a result of trauma. It's, it's, and, and to think that we have a system where, you know, each case is not dealt with individually. It's just like a blanket. You know what I'm saying? It's a point system. You rack up points and, you know, you could be a habitual offender and I could have never gotten in trouble. But if we commit the same crime, you know, it, it, it's just it's it's just mind boggling. I, I just it, it's just so broken. And. We are the United States of America. We're the supposedly the greatest country on the face of this earth and Norway's tearing down their prisons and we're building more mm -hmm. um it just it doesn't and and the conditions the conditions are just you know i think i told you before when i was on you know if 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 i would not have seen the things that i saw with my own eyes i would never in a million years believe it I, and i don't care if my daughter would have told me right. i just wouldn't have believed it you know and when i started seeing I was like, Lord, is this the purpose that I've been praying for? Because this is going to be a lot of work. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes you have to have a designated area, right? So, because um, sometimes change starts within a targeted area. Is, right. there, is there a specific area that you're going to start? Because that gives you the ripple effect. You know, it's like throwing a stone into some water, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean... When I personally started out myself, I just started advocating. I, I joined up with another advocation group and I just started helping people, you know, see people struggling, the loved ones struggling. They don't know how to get the proper medical attention. They don't know how to work the system, know the process, da, 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 da. But then as I spent more and more time, you know, behind the walls, you know, the guys are like, listen, we appreciate you out there you know, speaking for us, but you're fighting for air conditioning and we could give a damn about air conditioning. Okay. We need sentencing reform. Right. So then, you know, my partner sentenced to life and I had no idea that Florida had more life sentences than 38 other states combined. I mean, that, that just that statement alone is mind boggling. It is. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's a ton of other groups and they're like, let's fight for, you know, the felony murder rule. Let's get rid of that. Let's, let's fight for a PRR, um, you know, all these little different, you know, things. We looked at it as this is the biggest elephant in the room. This is the greatest sentence of all. If we can pull the ceiling down Start on this, mm -hmm. everything else is going to fall into place. And because it's, it's an emotional issue for my partner and visionary um, and the fact that he's been in there, he committed a crime when he was young, he's, he's done the work, he has a remorse of soul. He can, he, he, I believe that he's given us a, an upper hand, you know, in, in being incarcerated um, and the complexities of what really needs to be done because you have these legislators who have never you know i mean up until a couple of years when we challenged them visit a prison you right. can actually show up at a prison and because you're a legislator they have to let you in they didn't even know this okay we challenged them visit a prison go in there see what it's like you'll be mortified um up until that point they, they that was not an issue for them um, you know, so they're trying to create change and all of this, but they don't have any inside attachment and very few are directly impacted, you know? So I, I, until you're directly impacted, you have no idea. I, I bring the subject up to almost any, any person wherever I go. Okay. Cause it's, it's on my job to educate people and I bring it up and people are like, oh, that doesn't affect me. Are you a taxpayer? Yes. Well, if you're a taxpayer, it definitely affects you. 2.8 billion. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then I start to educate them and they're like, really? So I'm going to play the devil's advocate, right? Why would I, why would you want to release the seemingly most dangerous offenders sent, that were sentenced to life? 
So a lot of these offenders are labeled violent offenders. Now we could go back and forth on the definition of violent, okay? Um, but like I said before, uh, a lot of these people have never harmed anyone, you know? Um, we're the type of state, I don't wanna title it a three strike state, but basically if you got in trouble and that could be any kind of trouble, you, you could have been busted when you were in your early teens with a couple of personal joints on you. And then later on in life, you do something else, uh, you know, three strikes, you're out. And if you've ever done time in prison, and you get out, I don't care if it's 20 years later and you get in trouble, you are looked at totally different. You are going for life. Life That's sentences true. are given freely here. You know, and, well, and the lifers, you know, these violent offenders who, you know, have been sentenced to life, these are the ones that have literally grown out of their criminality. They've been in there for decades. I mean, I'm not the same person I was when I was in my teens. I'm not the same person I was when I was eight years ago. I'm right. going to be 56. I mean, these people have matured. They've grown out of criminality. They're no threat to society. I, I, you know, and, and there's so many. I mean, the aging population and what they, the strain that they put financially on this system. I mean, they're sick. They're dying. They need to be released. They are not a danger to themselves, to society, or anyone else for that matter. Let them go die with their family. During COVID, and I don't really have any pictures to, to say that this is true, but the body bags that were brought out of prisons were astronomical, the numbers of people who died during that time. So in the very beginning of COVID, um, there was like a ticker on the Department of Corrections website and they were very transparent. Um, and I, I believe that had a lot to do with Secretary Mark Inch at the time. Um, and they showed it by facility. Um, they showed um, how many people were quarantined, um, you know, everything, everything you needed to know. And then all of a sudden one day it just disappeared. Oh. What I do know from research is before COVID, there was somewhere in the number of 4,600 people mm -hmm. sentenced to life that were parole eligible. Now there's less than 4,000 and nobody was released on parole. Where'd they go? So, um, a lot of families, you know, they reach out and their loved one passed because of COVID when they could have been released and spent those years with their family. You know, there's California let out massive mm -hmm. amounts of people. Massive amounts. Massive. I, I mean, to the point where it was an issue because there wasn't enough housing. These people didn't have places to go. They weren't prepared. They didn't have money. Okay, but you know, there was so many people who, I mean, to the amount of people that we have incarcerated and the amount of people that were parole eligible who have been parole eligible for decades that mm. never get out, that are so old, that have loved ones out here and a place to go and people who want them, they could have released them on ankle monitors. Right. But people lost their loved ones for absolutely no reason. And it's this kind of stuff that, you know, it most nights I cry myself to sleep because it's everything about it is very sad and it's very broken. And I know that this is the purpose that God put on my heart and I will continue this fight until I take my last breath, but I will have to pass the torch to the generation behind me because there is so much work that needs to be done. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. So you said to your family, I'm going to be an advocate for people who are in prison for life. Tell me how that conversation went. I never said such a thing. <laughs> I never said such a thing. And um, it's kind of, 
up until this point, I have kind of lived a double life. Um, I have oh. been in the same profession for about 31 years in the same area. Um, and I could not risk the professional judgment. I am a single, you know, woman who um, loves someone that's sentenced to life in prison. Okay, um, I have no one to fall back on. My mother's elderly; she doesn't understand it. Okay, um, some of her I ideas when it comes to the incarceration are, are so out there. I just want to push the eject button. While right, I'm right, right, and, right, 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 you know, right. Mean, just like, <laughs> um, but. Yeah, you can only share it with people who are directly impacted. However, my advocation is growing. Um, Society First is becoming nationally known. Right. And, you know, people are titling me kind of as a human rights advocate. Um, you know, it's interview after interview, and it's getting harder and harder to hide. Um, and it, it's not that I, I, it's not that I don't want to hide it. Um, it's just not that you do want to hide it. it, it no, it's it's not. It, I don't want to hide it. Right. However, it's there's just so much judgment, and my life is 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 so full. I mean, I have a full time career. Um, I'm a caretaker when I leave my job, um, and then society first is blowing up. Okay, my plate is full. So to have any unnecessary um, you know, aggravation or negativity right. or judgment or anything right. like that. I just, right. I can't, you know, I just don't have the time or the energy for it. This literally, although I get joy out of seeing the light and the hope that God gives to these hopeless individuals through me, it's like, it's, you can see the swap as I give the hope and the light, I take the hopelessness and the burden. And it's it's hard. It's really, really hard. And it's sad because it's just one devastating, sad story after another. And my phone rings continuously. Awesome. Ever since I did the it paid newspaper interview that went right. to the prison and they <laughs> put my name and phone number in there, I mean, my phone doesn't stop. Um, and somehow some recent, um, article got into the federal system Right. And on Saturday, I got three notifications from the, the federal system that I needed to set up an account. And I'm thinking, what? So I set up an account and they're like, I, we heard about you and, you know, thank you for the work and everything. Do you have my name and number? I, I you know, I mean the mail, I, I had to put an ad on, um, volunteer dot match or something it's like a dating website for volunteers I need an assistant I can't keep up with this um dating app for volunteers that's funny <laughs> what is it called really <laughs> it's called volunteer dot com or volunteer match dot com I don't know something <laughs> and so listen I'm telling you that what you're doing what you're trying to do is like trying to ghostwrite. You can't do it. I got to do the best I can. You know, I mean, the, the I have authors all the time who say, oh, I want to ghostwrite this book because I, I don't want anybody to know it's going to be me. So how long do you think that's going to last? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because yeah, we're, I, we're in a, right. a society now that, um, unfortunately, there, you know, I used to think, oh, I'd like to go out and not, not let the world know I'm there, but you got cameras everywhere, right? right so, right. you know, you just really, really have to be careful. But I do understand you wanting some kind of anonymous life if you can, but, you know, your feet are wet now. I don't know. I just, you know, I don't Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I get so many letters of appreciation and mm -hmm. thank you and everything. And I just always say, it's not me. God is just using me Absolutely. as an instrument. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about the historical announcement. Can you talk about that a little bit? Now let's no, no, let's talk about the march that happened in February, if we could, right? Really quickly. Okay. So how yeah, that so, developed. <laughs> so how it got started was um 
we had a legislator house rep, Diane Hart, come to our um, conference and speak. Um, and then she had a actual parole bill House Bill 169 this session. And she kind of said, you know, hey, your goal and my goal kind of go together. How about if, you know, you do something on the Capitol and, you know, we kind of combine them. So we <laughs> said, all right, you know, we'll do a peaceful, a peaceful march um, because protests have been outlawed in the state. OK, so the whole time they kept saying, you need to get to the front. And I'm like, no, I'm in the middle, because when the cops come, I'm going to climb up the nearest tree. I, I was so paranoid. I've never been to jail. I was scared. Right, um, exactly. But, but, but all kinds of people came out, you know, a guy running for city commissioner and, you know, all kinds of people came out um, and we have it, it. It's documented. It was filmed, um, you know, needs to say. It's an election year. I didn't expect anything out of this session. Nothing ever happens session after session. Right. But this year, especially, it's an election year. Um, nothing happened with her house bill. But, you know, again, God used it and opened doors. Um, the speech that I gave there, apparently someone posted it on social media and it went viral. And I had people wanting to enter, reaching out from all over the nation, um, you know, and I, you know, people said that speech was so much compassion and this, that, well, I just walked like two miles. I don't walk anywhere. It was hot. Okay. I get there. <laughs> there was no mic. There was no podium. There were supposed to be police escorts that we paid for. Everything was wrong. When I got there, I was mad. Okay. So when I started speaking and then my passion just took over, but you know, the bottom line is these life sentences all root back to slavery in the constitution. And we have we have ripped down that Confederate flag, okay? We have tore down those Confederate statues and I'll be damned if we are not gonna strike down this Confederate law. It needs to go. Yes, it does. It needs to it, go. Indentured servitude, it's, it's gotta go. All of it's gotta go. And the other thing a lot of people don't understand is big business make money off the prison system. Right? Oh yeah, that's the problem. That's why we can't, the true yeah. meaningful report. There are clothes that are made there. There are license plates that are made there. there but it's, are... it's not even that. It's the money they make off of us, the loved ones right. that we pour into the system. Their canteen prices are outrageous. Rageous. You would think that they were eating at the Ritz. What they pay for a cup of ramen noodles is absurd. They pay almost $20 a case. What? Yes. Oh, wow. A pack of 12 colored pencils, Crayola colored pencils, $12.99. You can get them at Target and Walmart between $2.99 and $3.99. They sat down with the new secretary, Secretary Dixon, and he said, I'll fix it. So the price went down, I do believe, to $7.99, which is the price that you would pay if you ran into, you know, a convenience store. It's better than nothing, but it's out of control. You know, the phone calls. A year ago, I paid 62 cents for a 15-minute call. Today, I pay $5 for a 30-minute call. And if they call and it's disconnected or recording comes on and says no third party calls, which is like, what? You know, and it's just- That's what this is. <laughs> they, they, they cannot call back for 30 minutes. I mean, people are losing their life because of the phone lines, because of the lines waiting to use the phone. They only have so many phones. And if, if some are broken, you know, you got 80 men trying to get their phone call in on two phones between count times. Is this like telephone booths we're talking about? What, what we I'm sorry. No, it's it's the government. What are we talking about? Is this like a phone that's on a wall still? Or yes, yes. Get out of here. Yes. Yeah, a lot of people can't afford it. Okay, they have the new JPay. They have tablets. 
Um, I had a guy write to me the other day. He says, I got this tablet and I, I've been in here for 46 years. I don't know how to use this tablet. Who can help me use this tablet? Okay, it costs money to use the tablet. You know, they can download music, books, educational items, this, that, you know, movies. A movie that's 10 years old is $7.99. I, it, it, it goes on and on forever, okay? And then just tons and tons of complaints. I, I can't, my, it's, my tablet's not syncing. I'm missing precious videos and pictures. I, I mean, we pay a lot of money for those videos to send videos of, of, of family memories and, and, you know, pictures, Birthday. you know, it's like four stamps and, you know, it's like they get you coming and going. OK, and, and that's a billion dollar contract. I mean, the people who monopolize on just these contracts alone. Right. It goes on and on and on. They've taken away mail. Um, the phone calls are outrageous. The canteen prices have gone outrageous. Now, you know, I put money on all kinds of people's account, people that don't have anyone. OK, I mean, if, if to survive with no money, I mean, half the food is is mm -hmm. what they don't even know what it is that they're eating. And the portions are is just unreal. And some of the prisons are so overcrowded at this point because they've closed so many dorms because in those particular areas, they're so short staffed that they've literally taken away one meal. I, you know, and the proportion, I mean, like I, I've been in visit before and I'm like, what is that? And they're like, this is, this is our meal. I'm like, for a grown man, that's not even as substantial for a six-year-old, you know, and, and there's, you know, and there's advocacy groups that fight for that. And there's advocacy groups that fight for the phone contracts and everybody has their own particular goal, which I think is wonderful. I think it's all just horrible, but I'm only one person, <laughs> you know? Um, I'm only one person and the more and more guys said, we don't care. We don't care. We don't care. We don't care. Work on getting us out of here. So, you know, God worked that out and, and here we are, you know, but there's, there's a lot of things. They just tried to pass a rule and the rule is, you know, the governing body of the state facilities is, it's the department of, of corrections. They come up with these rules. I, I mean, it, it's like, I don't know who holds this agency accountable, but they're trying to pass a rule that I just heard last night has been changed. Thank God. But, you know, you can get a legal call. OK, I know when I was shopping for attorneys, my loved one wanted to interview the attorneys. OK, he wants to know, do you think you have a chance with my case? Do you want to take my case? Do you think you're going to, you know, have you had a case like this before? And what is and how much do you think that this is going to cost? OK, they said, if you if that attorney doesn't represent you, they can't call. So what happens to someone who has been sentenced? and needs post-conviction relief, wants to hire a post-conviction attorney for an appeal. I was like, what in the world are they trying to do? Keep them. It's, it, this is the United States of America. Okay, we should give these people whatever it is they need. I, I just don't get it. I, I don't, I, I can't remember if it was Gandhi or somebody said that you can judge a society on how they treat, you know, like the elderly the population is considered the worst of the worst. Okay. How we treat the worst of the worst. And this is just, this is, this yeah. is not good. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I said in my speech that you know, you said you wanted a pearl of wisdom or whatnot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, my pearl of wisdom is as a society, we can do better. As humans, we can do better. But as believers, we must do, do better. better. And, and that is just the bottom line. You know, well, I don't want you to end yet because we didn't talk about the historical announcements. So we want to talk okay. about that. Okay, so God opened, <laughs> God opened many, many doors and okay. he gave, you know, he gave my partner another vision and the vision is we're not getting anywhere with the legislators. The legislators hands are tied because it's big business. Okay. Right. So 
we started talking to attorneys. We started talking to former prosecutors, a retired judge. And what we have come to find out is that we can challenge the unconstitutionality of these life sentences. And God sent different organizations way bigger than us that have these types of resources. And we pitched to them, this is what we wanna do. We got all the names and DC numbers of everyone sentenced to life in the Florida Department of Corrections. And if we need to force their hand, we wanna force their hand. And we have had the ability with God's help to actually put together a team of attorneys who have agreed to represent all 13,866 thousand people to challenge the unconstitutionality of their census. Mm. They can't solicit the business. So people are going to have to reach out to us and we're naming it the road to restoration coalition. Um, and we basically will pair the attorney with the individual and it'll probably take a year to be able to sign up all these people because they're going to have to commit that they want to be a part of this. Right. Um, and then we're gonna overwhelm the court system and they are going to seriously have to do something that is gonna result in some true meaningful reform. Good for you. It's, it's illegal. Period, stop. So tell the audience how uh, we can assist with the volunteer.com or make a donation. <laughs> um, so we need volunteers. I mean, okay. specifically myself, I need an assistant. And of course it's all virtual, you know, it's phone calls, it's emails, it's, it's, it's whatever it's, you know, showing up at events, it's planning events, it's talking to legislators, it's taking calls, you know, it's, 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 triaging, I guess I'm in the medical field. So <laughs> triage the calls, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, we ask that if you're not directly impacted, you don't have a loved one or someone that means something to you that's incarcerated, um, that, but you believe in our cause, um, to please cover us in prayer because, um, the enemy is attacking us at every, every juncture. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, every time we take five steps forward, he is there waiting. Okay. I mean, the attacks that I've gone under just personally, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's, I mean, it's comical. I have to laugh at it. Okay. But I mean, it's like, this is big, this is serious business. I right. mean, he does not want this happening. Um, and we, you can go onto the website and you can go all the way to the bottom and you can donate money. I mean, the, the, the money from the lawsuit that he won is gone. Um, you know, we use that up with our inaugural conference, our March, and now this event, you know, we have to have shirts, we have to market, we, you know, it's flying to Tallahassee because, you know, it's a nine hour drive, you know, that's two days of driving. I, I had to get on a plane and fly. I had to fly, I had to march, I had to fly back and I had to get to work. You know, I mean, it's, 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 I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do both. Right, so I'm exactly. saying we're paying for, you know, funding. Um, but from what I understand, you know, because we're so relatively new and just coming out, you know, people that give grants, you know, you got to kind of be around and prove yourself. Oh, you they know, say so you got to be here two years, you have to have a budget taxes looked at all that. yeah i mean you know it's difficult and god has given us a wave of of momentum and we have got to keep that momentum going um so you know every day we we wait for him to prompt us and we try to continue to to walk in his purpose and you know we ask that even if it's twenty dollars no no amount is too little you know, um, you know, we ask for prayers, we ask for donations, and we ask if you can attend our function. So we show numbers that this means something to the taxpayers, that it's a waste of money. It means something to the loved ones. We need boots on the ground. Um, you know, so those are the ways, volunteers, donations, um, showing up at our events and prayers at this point.
Who knows? So, it'll be in six months. <laughs> so, so, Denise, there are people who do still are kind of scary about putting their credit card into the uh, system online. Is there a PO box that they can send a check to? Um, if they go to the website, um, they can literally the at the very top is the address of Society First. Um, okay. I operate it out of my home. Okay. Um, they can just make it payable to Society First. Um, actually, that's like the greatest way because all these other platforms take such a huge chunk. Money. Yeah, they it's do. Unreal. They do. I'm like, they maybe do. I'm in the wrong business. Right. <laughs> event right everybody wants a piece of the pie yes, exactly yes. so um yeah go to the website um make your donation that way uh, if you do it by mail it's probably um better for society first but i want to just say thank you for your advocacy uh denise it is um important that we all understand that uh, if we take care of the least of us the rest yes. of us will be all right. Mm -hmm. That is and, so true. And so many people don't don't understand that concept, but uh, it, it's real and it's true. And uh, I invite you back to Zoom in on a fresh conversation anytime. Um, we're here every Monday night. If you need another Monday night, I will find a Monday night for you, Denise. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Seriously, thank you so much for having me. Thank yeah. you so much for giving us attention and supporting us. Um, God only knows what, you know, what he has in store for us. So, you know, cover us in prayer and I'll definitely, you know, if we have, you know, a major breakthrough or something, right. I'll be calling you up. Oh, you don't have to have a major breakthrough to come back and talk, right? <laughs> No. You know, we can no, talk I'll about that. I'll definitely yeah. reach out and let yeah. you know how we're progressing, how we're yeah. going. Thank you very much. Everybody, Thank there you. are 13,000 plus people mm -hmm. serving life without parole in the state of Florida. Far more than any other state and almost a quarter of the total nationwide. Reach out to Denise Caffro, to Society First. Your $20 donation makes all the difference in the world. It only takes a moment to write a check. Um, it's a 501c3, Denise? Yes. So that makes your check and your money tax deductible. Just take a moment and just think about the old people, the young people, and the middle-aged people that will be incarcerated for the rest of their lives. I want to thank everybody for being here this evening, and thank you for being on Zoom and on a fresh conversation. Good night, everybody. Good night. God bless. Thank you. Mm -hmm.